Getting towards the end of 2023, which means me and you, we're probably trying to fit in a lot of books by the end of the year. Now, this year, I didn't set a numerical goal for myself for reading a certain number of books, but I know a lot of you did, and I want to help you reach that number. I've compiled a list of seven sci-fi and fantasy books that I think you're really going to like and are pretty quick reads. The first one is A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin. Now, this is a fantasy classic. This was written uh, back in the... When was it written? 1968. Uh, making it one of the OG YA fantasy books. Yes, this is written for like a middle grade or YA audience, uh, but it reads as if it's written for anyone of any age. A Wizard of Earthsea follows Ged, who's a young wizard in training, uh, as he's sort of learning how to use magic. He goes to a wizard school, which J.K. Rowling kind of ripped off. Really excited to learn. He's hungry for knowledge. He's hungry for power. And we see him mess up big time. <laughs> he accidentally summons this shadow beast. We see him grapple with the consequences of his actions, learn how to use magic, and try to right the severe wrongs that he's done. And keeping in mind, he is a very young man in this book. And the themes that we see come forth, uh, the things that we see him struggle with as a character, and the way we see him grow, uh, are really just very, very well done in this. What I love about the world of Earthsea is that uh, it's like a vast archipelago that covers a lot of area, and we get to see him travel around some of it. He gets the nickname Sparrowhawk because his one of his first works of magic is calling a Sparrowhawk uh, to fly around and, and land on his arm and things like that. When I read A Wizard of Earthsea, it gave me this like comforting feeling um, that only high fantasy gives me. The magic system in the series is unlike anything I've ever read. It relies on knowing the true names of things. Um, so anything you know the true name of, you have a sort of magical power over. So like, for example, if I was a wizard and my true name was some word that no one calls me, I would never tell anyone what that word is or else they would have this magical control over me. Sam might be my use name uh, where people can call me that and it's fine, it's like a nickname. But if anyone knows my true name, that's like them knowing my social security number. <laughs> In my opinion, this is like perfect for December and the winter months. It makes me feel right at home in this vast world. Le Guin's writing style is just one of the best that I've ever seen. Uh, she started out as a poet. That was her first sort of published work was all poetry, which is also fantastic, by the way. Uh, but the way that that informs her prose is just masterful. And she's able to communicate so much detail in so few words. So that makes this a short book that's really worth reading before the end of the year. And if you like it, there are three books that come after it. Those are The Tombs of Atuan, The Farthest Shore, which I'm trying to get the cover that matches all of these, and Tehanu. And I honestly, like, I liked The Tombs of Atuan probably even better than A Wizard of Earthsea. Uh, there's just something about it that is so palpable. Like, it is like A Wizard of Earthsea is Le Guin showing us this incredible world and giving us a taste of it. The Tombs of Atuan is Le Guin playing in this amazing world and showing us the potential that it holds. So Ged is actually kind of a secondary character in this. Uh, and the one that we follow in Tombs of Atuan um, is, is like a priestess of the old gods, basically. It, but she's like a kid. And it's so... Oh. I, the vibes of this are freaking incredible. But, uh, but yeah, A Wizard of Earthsea is definitely one that you should be checking out. Next up is A Psalm for the Wild Built. So in A Psalm for the Wild Built, we follow sibling Dex, who is a tea monk. And as a tea monk, it's their job to go around to different towns, serve tea to the residents there, and give them advice, basically. Um, it's almost like a therapist role in this world. Now, long before the story takes place, um, the robots in the world decided, hey, we just gained sentience, we're gonna up and leave and go live in the woods. We're not gonna be working in factories. We're not gonna be running everyone's computers. We're gonna go live in the woods. And the humans respected that. And for a thousand years, they lived completely separately. Uh, and so this is almost a first contact story in that way. We see the first robot in a thousand years contact humanity again. The way that that meshes with Sibling Dex's personal journey and character arc is really cool and it's just such a heartwarming book. Uh, this is one of my favorite books that I read last year and it's just a novella. It's, um, it is 147 pages and it was one of the best books I read last year. Every chapter does so much heavy lifting for the story. The thematic depth it's able to get into in such a short page count, genuinely mind blowing. I cried at multiple points in this. Uh, the characters are so believable and the challenges they face are so real and so relatable. 
um, that it's hard not to empathize with the characters and really want the best for them. This is probably the most like cozy heartwarming book I've ever read and it also destroyed me in a way that I can't describe. <laughs> uh, but it also built me back up from that destruction. The way that that felt is something that I seriously wish I could experience again. And if you like it, guess what? There's a sequel. <laughs> the sequel is A Prayer for the Crown Shy. In my opinion, this is really freaking hard to top and this comes close. It doesn't quite do it, but it's still really freaking good. Um, and uh, yeah, if you like A Psalm for the Wild Bill, you're also probably gonna like A Prayer for the Crown Shy. So definitely check them out. Uh, me and my girlfriend actually did um, a buddy read of this where we both annotate the, um, I read it and annotated it and then she read it and annotated it. Uh, so we have a copy with both of our notes in it, both of our thoughts in it. Um, and so th this is a really good book to do that with because it's just like, there's something about it that is so full of hope and joy, even when the going gets tough. Uh, and and yeah, that made this a really good book to, to do that with. And it's fun to share it with someone else. Um, reading can be quite a solitary hobby. Seriously, check this out. One of the best books I've read in recent memory. The next book I want to mention is to be taught if fortunate also by Becky Chambers. Becky Chambers is just crushing it. I don't <laughs> I don't know what she is putting in these books, but it is working. To be taught if fortunate follows Ariadne, who is a uh, who is an astronaut from like an international space organization in the future. Her and her team have like an itinerary of a few different planets that they have to go study uh, as part of their mission. This book asks the question of what would happen if we sent a group of humans out on an interplanetary mission and then while they were out on the mission, we forgot about them and humanity has moved on and they're just out in space. Um, so <laughs> they, there are a couple approaches that Becky Chambers could have taken with this. She could have gone like the survival apocalyptic route where it's like, oh no, humanity forgot about us. We're gonna run out of oxygen. But she took it in such a more interesting way. Uh, instead, she asked, how would the crew react to this? And what might their response mean for the mission? and how would that play out in group dynamics? Um, what's the relationship that these characters have with each other that would allow them to cope with such a thing? So it's great with the character work. I feel like I got to know all of the individuals in this book pretty well. We got to see them in stressful situations, in joyful situations, uh, and overall spend a lot of time with them in, again, a very cozy outer space setting. A Psalm for the Wild Belt had a completely different world that it took place in with its own history and all that. Uh, this one does start on Earth. Um, they leave from Earth to go on the mission. Um, so it is, I don't know how to classify that. I guess it's like low sci-fi. <laughs> I don't know. Also a freaking solid book. This one is, um, this is like under 150 pages. It's a book that's both cozy and thought provoking. The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. So this is one that I read back in 2021. Going into this expecting, you know, a pure classic. And um, in a lot of ways it was that. It had kind of inaccessible language, uh, very old fashioned, uh, referencing things that have been outdated for centuries, not centuries, for like a hundred years. But if you're curious about sci-fi and its origins, this is a pretty interesting one to check out because it shows you sort of where uh, this genre sprouted from. There are tons of examples of books that go back this far and further that do that too. A uh, notable one is Frankenstein, which I haven't read yet. But this is another example of a classic that is also sci-fi and kind of showed me that those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. In sci-fi, there's a history of being excluded from literature as if science fiction as a genre is a different thing from literature and therefore not worthy of literary merit, which is total BS. Uh, I could write a whole essay about it and maybe I will, but The Invisible Man definitely showed me that those two things aren't mutually exclusive. It can be sci-fi through and through and a classic through and through, um, and it can be literature that has literary value. It has like science experiments gone wrong. It uses like the mechanisms of mass hysteria. It really taps into a lot of central themes that come up time and time again in science fiction and just in our lives in general. <laughs> Some people think that sci-fi predicts the world that we'll one day live in, but really it's almost always just describing the world we live in. I think H.G. E. Wells does a really good job playing out what it might actually be like if there was an invisible man running around the countryside and he had the personality of, of the character in the book. So really interesting read. I'm glad I read it. It took me a little bit longer uh, just because of the inaccessible language, but it's still a short read uh, and worth checking out if you're curious about science fiction classics. The Lathe of Heaven, also by Ursula K. Le Guin. I didn't realize I had two repeat authors on this list, but they're both such great authors that 
I don't mind at all. <laughs> the Lathe of Heaven follows our protagonist, George Orr, who's a resident of futuristic Portland, Oregon. And he realizes that he has dreams that change reality. He, he falls asleep, he has a dream, and then that dream that he just had changes reality and he's the only one who knows. Freaking phenomenal concept. I absolutely love that as a premise and it's even better than I imagined as it plays out. There's this evil doctor named Dr. Haber who's trying to like manipulate George as he's, <clears throat> as he's supposedly treating his condition, which is a really messed up dynamic. And we get to see Dr. Haber's corruption arc as he like succumbs to this, this siren call of power. We see George trying to grapple with the ethical implications of what he's able to do. Most importantly, I think we get to see what power looks like when wielded by someone who can't control it and someone who wants to control it. I'm honestly due for a reread on this one because I just loved it so much and it was so thought provoking. I haven't stopped thinking about it since I read it like two years ago. Actually, no, last year, a year and a half ago. The Lathe of Heaven by Ursula K. Le Guin. Now this next one also falls in the kind of messed up but really freaking cool category. That's China Dream by Ma Jian. So this book is banned in China and Ma Jian is exiled. And the cover art is uh, by Ai Weiwei, who is an artist who's also exiled from China uh, because of his art. Uh, and so being someone who's fascinated by Chinese history, I studied Mandarin and, and just love um, Chinese culture and learning about it. This book did so much so well. The premise is that we see we see our protagonist Ma Daode uh, being tasked with creating a China Dream device. Uh, so if you're not familiar, the China Dream is a piece of rhetoric that Xi Jinping keeps on bringing up in terms of having like national unity and a unified goal for the country and what the China dream is. This is this is a great example of a book with a main character who absolutely sucks in most ways, but he's so interesting to follow because he sucks in interesting ways. <laughs> so our protagonist Ma Daode is tasked with creating a China dream device, which can be implanted in people's heads basically download the china dream to everyone i thought that was going to be the main thing that happens in the story is like him you know figuring out how to do that wondering if it's the right thing to do that kind of stuff but there is so much more <laughs> that happens that i did not see coming and by the end of the book it is so far from that premise that i just can't even describe it to you without spoiling the entire thing and the way we got there is so logical and so steeped in historical context and so just like unfortunate but accurate and most importantly to the plot of the story he survived the cultural revolution and his participation in it as a child this book spends a lot of time unpacking his personal trauma um, associated with the cultural revolution and uses his memories as a way to show us just how horrific and terrible of a time in history that was we see the ways that as an adult he suppresses it uh, we see how that impacts his life and the decisions he makes. Uh, this is fundamentally a book about generational trauma. Today in 2023, the Cultural Revolution in China took place less than one lifetime ago, which means there are tons of people in China who have traumatic experiences, not unlike the ones that we see in this book. Yeah, as a total history buff and Chinese culture nerd, uh, I ate this book up. Uh, and I have a few more of his books sitting on my shelf waiting to be read because man, I could not put this book down. And to end on a lighter note, I have This Was Our Pact by Ryan Andrews. Uh, if you've been paying attention to the channel the past couple weeks, I've been raving about this book. Um, I'm a substitute teacher and this book has been in multiple of the classrooms that I taught in. So naturally I had to see what all the hype was about and man did it deliver. Uh, I sat down and read this book in one day. It looks pretty thick, but trust me, graphic novel pages go way faster than normal book pages. The art style is just awesome. I love good illustrations. Uh, being someone who loves to draw myself, panel by panel, seeing how awesome these illustrations are and the way that they tell a story so cohesively is just graphic novels as a medium impressed me in that way, but this one in particular was such a nice vibe to it. The way I'd, I've been describing it is like over the garden wall if it was modern themed rather than cottage core. That said, it doesn't lack cottage core, uh, but that's just not the, the main aesthetic. We see Ben and Nathaniel, our two main characters, go on a trip down the river to find out where the autumn festival lanterns end up. They have a legend in their town that the lanterns go off into the sky and join the Milky Way, but they're not so sure about that and they wanna get the truth. They wanna see where these actually go. And the quest that they go on is exciting, it's gripping, it gives 
gives us a whole host of interesting characters, including but not limited to a talking bear and a witchy witch. <laughs> it's a story of friendship and commitment and um, problem solving and being kind to others. It's a really wholesome book and uh, made me feel just great while I was reading it. It's perfect for this time of year because it is autumn right now. And also this would be a super cozy book to read over the winter just as well. So those have been my seven short book recommendations uh, to finish off the year with. Uh, I read all of those and there are also a few short books that I plan on reading uh, and I'll let you know if those are worth it next year when I do this video. <laughs> if you want even more short book recommendations, I made a video just like this last year with all different books. Uh, so feel free to click on that. It'll be up here. And I hope you find something you want to read before New Year's. Get that reading goal done. Okay, that's all. See ya.